The nervous system is the most complex and highly organized body system. It directs our body's reactions to the world and controls most of our internal functions, everything from muscle movement and blood vessel dilation to even learning embryology. I've described the cells and the cytoarchitecture of the peripheral nervous systems in previous videos. This video is part of a series on the embryonic development of the nervous system. This is part one, Nurulation, and I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. Ultimately, the job of our nervous system is to control the body within a changing environment. And this requires a system that can extract information from the environment using sensory receptors. It then sends signals that encode this information into the central nervous system, processes the information to determine an appropriate response, and sends output signals to activate that response, such as running. The complexity of our nervous system has made it possible to have advanced capabilities such as vision, social interactions, coordination of organ systems, and integrated processing of signals. It also, in humans, our intricate wiring also makes it possible for us to have language and abstract representation of concepts. Now the nervous system is one of the earliest systems to begin development and one of the last to be completed after birth. So this developmental process generates this most complex structure within the embryo, but it also means that in utero insults during the months of pregnancy can have all different kinds of consequences. The first indication of the developing CNS appears in week three as a plate of thickened ectoderm in the mid-dorsal or central region of the trilaminar embryo, which you can see in this cartoon. And this region is called the neural plate. Now it's hard to get a sense of what it kind of looks like in a cartoon. So here on the left, I'm showing you a neural plate stage so here on the left, I'm showing you a neural plate stage frog embryo that I've stained for a gene called SOX2. And SOX2 marks all the cells in the neural plate. So you can get a sense of this broad, flat plate of thickened ectoderm. Now the neural plate extends from the oral pharyngeal membrane to the primitive node. We know from experiments in model organisms, fate mapping experiments, that the basic organization of the central nervous system is determined even at these very early stages. So what that means here is that this area on the left, the brain plate, actually predicts the organization of the adult brain as depicted in this cartoon. And that more caudal one-third of the plate will form the spinal cord. Now neurulation, which is formation of the neural plate and then the neural tube, actually begins during the fourth week, around day 22 or 23 in the region of the fourth to sixth pair of somites. Here you're looking at an electron micrograph of a cross section of a roughly three, three and a half week old embryo. And you can see the ectoderm in blue, the mesoderm in pink, and the endoderm in yellow. This is our trilaminar embryo. Now the ectoderm that's going to form the neural plate, which I've shown here in pale blue, sits above the notochord. And recall that the notochord which is a transient midline mesodermal structure. The neural plate tissue also sits above the paraxial mesoderm. Now what's different about that ectoderm? So what actually directs those cells to become neuroectoderm and then to form the nervous system? Well, let's take a look. Now we know that the ectoderm that I've shown here in the darker blue secretes a protein called bone morphogenetic protein 4, or BMP4. Now BMP4 binds to receptors in the ectoderm, and in doing so, it actually prevents formation of the neural plate. However, at gastrulation, the notochord begins to secrete BMP4 binding molecules. So essentially these molecules are going to bind up BMP in that ectoderm right over the notochord. And that means that this area has low BMP signaling. And so this means that different molecular pathways are activated in that ectoderm which is going to allow those cells to actually differentiate as neuroectoderm and to become the neural plate. Now this whole process is called neural induction, which is actually kind of a misnomer because we know now that neural tissue is actually the default tissue. It's not actually induced. It's that other ectoderm is actively blocked from forming it. All right, so now we have a flat plate of neuroectodermal tissue and it's fated to become nervous tissue. But now we're going to have to take that flat plate of tissue. It's going to have to undergo morphogenetic movements 
where the sides or neural folds are going to roll up and they're going to roll up into a tube which will seal off and eventually move inside the body. So let's take a look at the continuing process of neurulation. Now this cartoon summarizes the main steps of neurulation beginning with neural plate formation that I've just described. Next, those edges or neural folds will begin to elevate, approaching each other at the midline. And then they undergo a series of morphogenetic movements, and so those edges will finally meet to form a tube, and they will eventually fuse, forming a sealed tube. Now the cranial part of that tube is going to become the brain, and the caudal part is going to become the spinal cord. The lumen of the tube is going to become the neural canal. So first that communicates with the amniotic fluid, but eventually it will become the ventricles of the brain and the central canal of the medulla and the spinal cord. Its walls will get thicker and the neuroepithelial cells will become the neurons and macroglia of the CNS, which I described in other videos. Now, when those folds start to fuse beginning in week four, some of those neuroectodermal cells are going to undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition. They'll delaminate from the neural plate and they'll kind of hang out for a little bit between the neural tube and the surface ectoderm, as I've shown here in green. And then they'll migrate out to many locations in the body. These are neural crest cells, and they form an awful lot of the body. And I'll talk about them and their fates in part three of my series on neural development. But for now, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into neural tube closure. So here you see an embryo at about day 20. So you're looking down on it, you can see that broad neural plate and the neural folds are quite visible, and you can see that a tube is beginning to form. Now fusion of the folds is going to start at around 4th to 5th somite, so this is around the cervical region, and then it's actually going to proceed in both directions. So it's going to proceed both cranially and caudally, so you can imagine a two-way zipper. Now by day 23, the tube is mostly fused except for an opening at the cranial end and an opening at the caudal end, and these are the neuropores. Now I want to note here that cranial, rostral, and anterior are all used to describe that, that headmost neuropore, while the caudal neuropore is sometimes called the posterior neuropore. The cranial neuropore is going to close first, about 25 days of development, and the caudal one will follow about three days later. You don't have to know those exact dates, but you ought to know that the caudal one closes later. Importantly, failure of these openings to close constitutes a major class of neural abnormalities, the neural tube defects. Now I'm not going to go through all the different types of neural tube defects here, but I will describe a few. So first, let's take a look at what happens when the cranial neuropore fails to close. So the image that you see here shows anencephaly the absence of a major portion of the brain, skull, and scalp, which I realize can be quite disturbing. Anencephaly can also be called craniosquesis, which is a closure defect of the brain. Now the failure of the neuropore to close essentially prevents the skull vault from forming over the region, and the forming brain tissue is then exposed to amniotic fluid and much of it degenerates. So infants with anencephaly are usually born without the forebrain, cerebral hemispheres, and cerebellum. Now most of the time the remaining brain tissue is exposed, as you see in this image, because it doesn't have a skull or scalp to cover and protect it. Abnormalities of facial features are also common in anencephaly. Most often, anencephaly results in stillbirth. Infants with anencephaly may have reflex actions such as breathing and responses to some touch or sound, but they don't survive for more than a few weeks or days. This abnormality can be detected prenatally with ultrasound, and it is characterized by high levels of alpha-fetal protein and sometimes polyhydramnios, which is just a fancy way of saying too much amniotic fluid. Now what happens if there's a closure defect of the spinal cord? So spinal dysraphism refers to a broad group of malformations that affect the spine or surrounding structures. The closure defect influences not only the development of the central nervous system, but also that of the vertebral arches that lie above it. So this means that we have an opening of the vertebral canal, or spina bifida. Now the term spina bifida is often used interchangeably with spinal dysraphism. But spina bifida, which literally means cleft spine, 
is characterized by the incomplete development of either the brain, the spinal cord, and or the meninges. And it's the most common congenital malformation of the CNS. There are different types and degrees of spina bifida, which depend on the number of non-fused neural arches and what other structures happen to be affected. And so the clinical consequences can be insignificant, serious, or even fatal. Now, common to all types of spina bifida is an absent closure of the vertebral arch. That is, the open neural folds in the spinal region are going to prevent the sclerotrome-derived vertebral arches from actually covering the neuroepithelium, so that cleft spine. Now, we know from transplantation experiments in model organisms that the neural tube does have an inductive effect on the development of the vertebral arches, but how this actually happens at a molecular level is not really well understood. So let's take a look at a couple types of spina bifida, and we'll actually start with both the mildest and the most severe cases. In this first cartoon, you can see myeloschisis, which is the most severe form of spina bifida. Here, the nerve tissue is fully bare and a dermal or meningeal covering is absent. With this, ab with this abnormality, the closure of the neural folds completely fails to occur. On the other end of the spectrum, spina bifida occulta occurs very frequently and is usually found accidentally in x-rays or in an examination of the back. Here, the bony plates that form the bony spine covering the spinal cord do not form completely, so this is essentially a defect of the spinous process. And you can see that here in this x-ray that shows a defect in L5 in a 40-year-old man, so this is an incidental finding. Spina bifida occulta usually involves the lower lumbar sacral spine, and it seldom has clinical relevance because only that neural arch fails to fuse without the spinal cord with its membranes or meninges being involved. And the skin covering is intact. So sometimes you'll see a tuft of hair as shown in the cartoon or a dimple that will tell where the osseous structures are actually missing. In other forms of spina bifida, besides fissures of those osseous structures, there are abnormalities of the meninges or even the spinal cord, and the membranes can be present or absent. In meningocele, the dura mater may be missing in the area of the defect, and the arachnoid layer then bulges prominently under the skin through the cleft in the malformed vertebral arch. While in a myomeningocele, the meninges, as well as the spinal cord or the myelon, are found outside of the vertebral arch. They're visible as a protrusion under the skin, and sometimes the skin is absent or very, very thin. Now, as you might guess, there can be differing degrees of neurological deficits, depending on the extent and position of the lesion. Some common symptoms include back pain, bladder or bowel incontinence, paraplegia, and spinal or lower limb deformities. Now, what causes these neural tube defects? It's not entirely clear, although it's likely that the etiology is multifactorial. So we know from a lot of research that genetic as well as environmental and nutritional factors play important roles. So for example, studies have shown that folic acid can prevent many neural tube defects. But for example, valproic acid, which is used to treat epilepsy, can increase the susceptibility to develop spina bifida. Now all of these defects are associated with high levels of alpha fetal protein, and they can be detected with fetal ultrasound. All right, let's recap. By day 28, we've altered the fate of some of the surface ectoderm to make neuroectoderm. That neuroectoderm has formed a closed tube and that tube is now inside the body and the neural crest cells have formed. At this point, the basic pattern of the nervous system is set up. In the next two videos, I'll cover early patterning and neural crest formation and migration. Thanks for stopping by.